Welcome to another edition of the Bandwagon Podcast. And today, um, my guest doesn't uh, need to have uh, a long introduction. What I will say, it's Mr. Raja Jussel, a.k.a. Desi Darkchild. How are you, brother? How are you, bro? I'm good, man. Happy New Year to everyone. Yeah, Happy, Happy New Year to yourself. That's good. I definitely will say that your background is probably the most uh, impressive that of, of all the people who have kind of I've interviewed so far. It's so musically aesthetic. It's, it's, uh, are you able to just tell us what it is? So those people who are listening in. Uh, uh, basically, I'll, I'll this is all my YouTube. hardware that I use. Um, I'm pretty old school. I tend to use a lot of um, uh, like um, sound modules since um, this is all wrapped up and it's all hardware. Um, I use and I try and use unique sounds in my music because we're used to the tumbi and all the other um, uh, sarangi, vajja, we're used to all of that. I try and implement some background <laughs> noises, so to say. Um, well, some synth sounds, some unique sounds, especially with the dub reggae and the reggae stuff I produce. It's not just like, you know, pressing three chords, three keys, and you got a standard like, you know, you got a standard sort of like, a, a thing kicking off where you've just got a standard organ sound. I actually add in stuff. And where I get that inspiration is, is from Mukhtar Sahuta, where he used to use a sound and he used to multiply the sound by adding other synth sounds to create a massive sound, which today cannot be copied. And that's what the, for me, that's what the angle of music is, to be creative, to not just be creative with a Vajja sound, it's to be creative with what goes on with the Vajja as well. So yeah, it's one of them. I mean, just just a minute into this conversation, you, you know, the, from the, the the depth of knowledge in terms of what you've been doing, how did your journey get to this point in terms of your, especially your musical journey? Uh, basically, I started at a very tender age, like when I was about five, six years of age. And I actually, uh, my mama, uh, Maluk Shambangu, he lives in Wolverhampton and basically he had um, some bongos, just some premier bongos. I didn't know what they were. I just loved the sound of them. Mm. And I started bashing them around. He left them at my mum's and my dad's house at that time. And basically, um, it was Christmas and they were coming over. And I don't know whether you remember the big beer barrels. I'm talking back in the days, the big beer barrels. The wooden they ones. They in Morrison's every now and again in Christmas. Yeah. But these ones were massive. They were like, I don't know, but at least one and a half foot high, you know, uh, about 15 to 12 um, inches in diameter. And mm. they were full with beer. You used to punch a hole in them. They used to have a little cap and you'd mm. screw in a tap. And I know what you're talking about. Home. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. So I basically, you. when they used to empty, my mama used to play a shilla because he was a dolky player. And he used to sing with my other mama. And my dad would be there. My cha would be there. They'd be all in the front room near Christmas having, you know, the usual peg and glassy and chicken and everything, yeah. And they'd be singing their hearts out. And I used to keep my head in. You know, I used to walk around with Maxim and stuff, you get me, <laughs> back in them days. But I remember them days clearly, and I used to be inspired by that. And then one day, uh, my brother started playing it. He got a hold of the beer can and started playing it really well. And my mama taught him some tips. From him, I thought, OK, if he could do it, I could do it. So I put down the action men and all the other toys, and I picked up that toy, and that was it. Uh, to be honest, I've not learned hard from anyone, but I'm inspired by a lot of talented people around me. Um, we're lucky we got YouTube. YouTube sort of extended my library and ability to play better and to be better. Because um, there's a lot of um, massive, massive hold of um, talent on there, to be honest. So as you were growing up then, when did you take it, you know, when did you physically say, right, okay, I'm moving away less from the beer barrels and I'm going to pick up a doll key, for example? Well, like I said, I had this bongo. I tuned that up to be a dorky originally. You just I put skins on it? My, yeah, I, I started <laughs> playing with a band called Njanda Group. And I actually made that sound come out like a dorky. And basically what happened was um, the dorky sound that I was getting was, um, it was like better than a dorky because I had a plastic sort of skin on one side. And I thought, wow. And, and when I used to play, they used to mic up with two mics. The, the sound engineers or the, the local guy who'd be doing the miking, and he'd make it sound like a doll. And I thought to myself, wow, this is amazing, you're getting this kind of sound. And to be honest, when I first actually, before even going on stage, when I first actually um, did something in school, it was like we had a talent show in the junior school, mm. if I remember, and there was this guy called Rajiv, and um, he sang um, 
महबूबा हूँ महबूबा बिकॉजे loads of claps and then uh, we had a we had a frederick bird junior school steel band which was in relation with phase 1 steel band which is a multi european orchestrated steel band band and uh, basically I had an opportunity to play with them on a few occasions and then I was playing actual drums I moved from uh, tolki uh, bongos to drums I had a few uh, lessons with a guy called steven phillips and basically I learned from him then I moved over to my friend Chris Evans who I started learning some major drum fills and stuff and then it just grew from there to be honest and now I could play uh, uh, quite a few instruments I'd say quite so happily was it like the remol skins that you would put that you stick on the beer barrels or was it equivalent at, at that time no it was just the beer barrel itself it was just the sound it made it was that old you know yeah. like a gara sound yeah you know, that's, it, that's it yeah yeah and yeah. it had that kind of tinny sound and like You know there was this young guy on uh, YouTube who's playing a mandolin with his chacha and he's playing it on on a on an empty can of some sort or a patilla I can't even remember or a garba and um, basically he's singing all monic tracks and you know they gone really far with just going on YouTube but someone actually posted the video for him um and that went viral and people are listening even myself I caught up uh, You know, I caught up with that video and I thought, wow, this reminds me of me, you know, <laughs> and it's amazing what you could do with any kind of, um, you know, um, any kind of patilla, empty tin. It's amazing. Everything's got a sound to it of some sort, you know, and so we're away, blessed by that. Away from the music then, what was a young, De- uh, uh, well, I, was, I think Desi Darkchild comes a little bit later down, down the line, I'm, I'm guessing. What was a, yeah. a, a, a young Raj Jussel like? I was naughty. <laughs> used to get in trouble by my Punjabi teacher he used to kick me out of the class for banging on the tables and stuff it was a real bad habit i i i created a real bad habit uh we used to uh, in college and that we used to have like a uh, theater place and they used to have props like old um, you know kitchen sinks and baths and stuff for drama theater yeah you know um and basically i used to turn that thing upside down and get a nice big bass sound and tap in the side <laughs> trying to play it all out of it even but the bmc remembers them days you get me so yeah it's funny how things just um take action from that point so were you then channeling all your kind of your attention and all your kind of energy into the music did you know music was going to be your future or did was there something else that you were kind of encouraged to get into as well well to be honest yeah, um we had a garage uh, at the back of our house and in the back of our house it was like alleyways i don't know whether you remember the old alleyways we've still got them in like uh, manchester uh, we've still got them up in uh, london where you got like not entries we call yeah, alleyways sh- yeah, 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 yeah. and that- they were really like a meter in width you know da- you dangerous get- it- really good if you're running away from someone <laughs> that's right and the thing is they used to interlink with all the back of the houses and uh, what it was i was very inspired by my friend harvey and his dad they used to have a little garage just into the back of the alleyway that led onto a street which widened up and they had a garage which was a funny turning and i used to go there every friday saturday i used to go there get inspired by holding a few of their tools you know helping changing um uh, cortina wings capri wings they were all bolt on stuff and um i got inspired into going into bodywork then i done a bit of mechanical then i done like um uh, i done a mechanical um mvq um uh, then i went into like uh, yts I done toy fitting I done quite a, a wide range of mechanical things and I actually worked in a couple of garages myself I actually owned my own business then we went into after painting the car you got to have it all cleaned out then I learned about professional cleaning that they call detailing now mm. so yeah I did I did quite a range of uh, jobs you know um, I worked in a couple of factories um to be honest I found that work very repetitive and boring um there was nothing new it was online on a track you're repeatedly doing the same thing you don't even need 
qualifications to do that. You don't even need a brain to do that. I'm not disrespecting anyone doing it, but it wasn't for me as a person. That was a no, you know, there was no actual interaction with... But you're, but you're a creator, people. you're a creator, though, ain't you? Yeah, so like, I, I've know. always been a creator, that's right. Even when I was a kid, like, you know, um, back in the days, you used to make, uh, like, go-cars and stuff, you know, getting all pram wheels and then trying to mess around with, like, a starter motor, converting that into a into a motor for the wheels. You know, I see all these things happening with a lot more technology today. And it makes me wonder if we had that technology back then, what I could have done, mm. you know? And, uh, you know, when the Sinclair car came out, I was very intrigued. I was very intrigued. I actually went to the museum about five times to the country transport museum just to get inside of like what's going on, you know? And then, you know, it was like motor trade was one of my favorite uh, sort of things, if I'm really honest. Mm. I had a few good cars myself back in the days. Which ones? Go on then, right? Tell me. Okay. I'm let let a... me guess. Let me guess. Yeah. I'm looking. You definitely had an XR3i. Ooh. Or, yes, or, I did. or a Cosworth. I had a Cosworth. I had a, I've had all the RS uh, vehicles, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, regarding Ford. I've had all of them, uh, if I'm honest. But um, uh, the, the last car the last car I fell in love with was a standard Ford Orion. The um, gear one, a gear 1.6 you No, know, just the standard. It was just standard <laughs> because um, why I bought a standard one, there was a lot I could do with it. You know, like putting a body kit on, learning about body kits, uh, alloy wheels. I've been, I've been blessed in that way. I've never had to pay a full price for anything. You know, I've always had that discounted. I feel quite privileged with all my friends being in certain parts of the trade where yeah. I could go over and say, oh, you remember me. Give me them, my little wheels. Give me so much. And you're not having a deal. Um, so, yeah, it was always good to do that. Yeah. And and so you're building this skill set up. You, you've got this going and the music's going at the same time. When did yeah. when, when did you feel, did one take over the other in terms of interest or, you know, explain well, that? Like I said, I was naughty in school. Uh, before I knew I was going to have the Punjabi lesson, I used to get kicked out of class. So I thought, why not just wag it? Yeah. Um, I joined a <laughs> band in Coventry. They were actually called Parawanna Group. Then they changed to Parawanna Sangeet. And I actually joined them in the, the early parts of like, I'd say um, the 80s, mid 80s. But for them, that was early parts. And we developed like a new sound. We developed this uh, bongo sound, you know, with congos and bongos. I started playing. They did a lot of covers of Muhammad Rufi because the keyboard player, Harban Tamasi, bless his soul now, he's not too well at all. And uh, basically, he used to love singing Muhammad the Ruffy stuff. And as you know, with the Ruffy stuff, there's a lot of film Congos and stuff going off with India percussion. And we developed quite a lot of um, shows around the local pubs. We did the pub scene first. And then from the pub scene, people will take the business card off the group. And then eventually we leaked into the, the, the wedding uh, market. But from what my knowledge is, and what I can remember, the band itself was only four members in the band. I was the fifth. Were you and, the youngest? Uh, Were you the youngest, right? I was the youngest. I've always been the youngest in that <laughs> band. Uh, I was always the youngest in a lot of bands, to be honest. But yeah, it, it was just a scale I needed. And it was quite interesting because they weren't just doing Bangra, you know, the typical, you know, what was going around circuit Bangra. It was all different genres of music they were doing. And um, it was quite fun. Um, and then eventually we grew to a nine ten piece band as the years went on. So Raj, how, how did you then, um, how did you then kind of, you've got older people in the into the band, um, you, you're listening to new sounds and you, you, you got your ear to the street for, for you know, for various kind of, um, you know, friends or genres out there. How did you then kind of uh, put your stamp on some of the music that being produced? Did you did it become a heavy reliance on you, or or were you just kind of a member and you just basically just concentrated on playing your instrument? Um, where I actually got very intrigued and where I was pulled with a lot of interest, where it was put on my shoulders was we were doing an album called Teri at the Meridian for one last and that was the first time that we were going to have major like drum fills and drums. And um, with my experience learning from um, a lot of other people as well, um, like I used to watch the local mainstream band, the specials, because uh, a lot of the lads were from Coventry. I actually know 
uh, the main member of specials I found out, which is Neville Staples. Um, during my time, I had sort of like had the opportunity to work with uh, Stereo Nation Taz, and his music was another very, commentary, another commentary guy. Yeah, his music was very um, uh, drums and so forth, uh, Western. Um, like when Hit the Deck come up, we actually played on his wedding, mm. and it was like amazing because like at that time he was advancing his music game. You know when he come up with that album, and it was a blessing to be on stage on his wedding to be playing there. And um, you know I picked up a lot of stuff where the where the whole inspiration of bringing the drums into the bhangra came in for Parwana Sangeet was when we were working on the album Daddy at the Mary, where I actually had the opportunity to work alongside um, some of the uh, best drummers, studio drummers. And I learned a lot from them and they learned a lot from me. Um, I'm a left-handed drummer, so um, everything had to be changed around in the studio and the mic in positions. And, I, and, and then I had the opportunity of recording with Roger Lomas with a band called Headspace. Um, they were signed to Fatboy Slim Records. And there was quite a lot of stuff like that around me, you know, like the music circle I had, there was a lot I could get and a lot I was involved in. So I tried to get involved in as many things as I could back then, yeah. So you know that, like, just for the for people um, who may not have a, a kind of musical kind of background, what's the difference between kind of, you know, from you, you just said it, like a normal drummer to a studio drummer? Okay, studio drummer, obviously you're playing on a, what we call a click sound. And also you've got to be tight with your fills. You don't have this slackness on stage. Um, too many mans are playing the full, full beats, you know, the simple ch -ch 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 -ch, that kind of stuff, you know, which you, you get away with every song. You know, even like there's a lot of, there's a lot more to just a chick chick beat, you know, mm. what we're hearing. Um, but it's what works. It's what works to be honest for me it didn't work i used to play like triplets and stuff like that even with the fills i you know i was i was probably um i wouldn't say the first i actually was an inventor and a creator yet i actually created a double pedal left-handed double pedal for a kick drum and i remember like i used to take bits from work like screws and washers and stuff to make the rods and then now i think you can get a uh, left and right sided uh, double kick Mm. Uh, drum kick uh, uh, bass drum pedals now uh, but back then you couldn't so I actually ended up creating my own and I used to have like I couldn't even get the aluminium because aluminium was scarce back then so we actually used a stainless steel plate from work, drilled it out weighed it up amongst the actual aluminium original plate I had to make sure that the balance is equal so that when you're playing the kick drum that the pedals you know there's a, a natural flow mm. then getting the springs was quite easy because you could get parts for pedals anyway getting the main structure was easy so there was a lot of that kind of stuff going off yeah it was quite interesting for me i've but, done uh, a lot of fun game like yeah, that no, no imagine if you had the patent for that you'd be a bloody millionaire yeah i mean I, it, you know what yeah People don't understand to be a creator, you got to have a lot, a lot of money. It doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. You, money is the main game now, yeah? You Even with the Pongra industry, you could be the worst singer. And you if you got a lot of money, you could buy anything you want in this game, which is sad for people like myself, because I don't have that kind of money to just chuck in and buy views. And I won't do it. You mm. go on my YouTube, you'll only see a 1,000 to what? 2,000, maybe 3,000, maybe 7,000 max. And they're all genuine views. And I'm proud of that myself because I don't believe in fakeness. I've never believed in fakeness because of my upbringing, of my background, the way I did the standing on a wing of a car, you know, how I was applying the filler. All of these things matter to me. And that's the same buildup I've got around me in my studio. For me, it's it's all about the buildup, you know. If your buildup is great, then I don't think you even need a video. I don't think you even need to spend money on buying fake views. You could just go out there and do it. And I believe in that because I've proved it. I've the, proved it many times. So how, how did... Uh, we're, we're, getting, we're getting into it right now. I, I was going to kind of save it till later because I wanted to showcase the the other side of, you know, of your of your skills and stuff that doesn't necessarily yeah. get a lot of the deserved attention that it should. I mean, like, do you... How do you then balance out this, this uh, issue uh, yourself where you've got, 
people, let's say you've done the mint, done it, and we'll use the car analogy in terms of where you've yeah. sanded it down and you've done it all, or then you can just go and buy a ready paid, a ready made part, you know, without understanding the actual beauty behind it. So, if, from a music point of view, you've got, let's say, computer programmers of putting things together and then you've got you've got the traditional producers who are actually learning the actual pieces and doing it themselves do you think that one is better than the other or do you think there's a place for both of them now um i think i think there's a place for both of them but it depends like what your background's been mm. what you've been inspired by to be honest and that's a big impact on everything what anyone does in life you got to you know it's good to have an ego but it's also bad to have an ego if you got it the wrong way. Mm. You know, ego is what you get out of bed for because you know you've got to clock into work, you know you've got to get up and do it. And then while you've got that ego, it's got to be on a positive level, you know. Um, a lot of people don't know me. Mm. They're not you know, of you. They don't know my background. <laughs> they don't know me, I'll be frank with you. Yeah, yeah. You know, and we got too many judges in life. And, you know, sometimes they're right in what they say. And sometimes you've got to listen to a lot of the people that you think are judging you 24-7 because they can be right. But then at other times in our industry, we've got a lot of haters, you know? And it, it's a balance of everything, isn't it? Mm. I think if you don't have haters, you don't want to you don't want to get out and do something better. If you've got haters, you want to achieve something for them to hate on even more. So mm. for me, I use haters as a positive thing. You yeah, know? so that's that's the, that drives you to do your next project and moving on, right. on on quickly and quickly. Well, I, I never rush a project, um, but um, I know a lot of people that do. But um, at the end of the day, what is quick in this industry where it's not gone anywhere in the last ten years? You know, mm. it's, it's a good, quick. It's, it was a good point because um, I, I did a podcast with uh, one of the uh, one of the Brit Asia team. And they were talking about uh, a new, a new, a, a guy from there, and he, and he basically was saying, he goes, if you look at what a DJ plays at a wedding, it's still majority are still some of the eighty percent are still some of the same songs that you were hearing ten years ago, <laughs> that are still the fillers and you know playing it. Do you think that that creativity then themselves in the industry has been lost, and it's become that repetitive thing that you know that you were once um, you, you were talking about yourself? Okay. Um... I don't want to sort of skip what you want to ask me, yeah, but it does it does touch on that point, yeah, where yeah. what you what you don't want me to say, I'm going to say because you got a lot of good music, new music out there. It's down to the DJs as well. Yeah, you know, if you're a good DJ, you will push any man's track that is danceable. Yeah, let's just say it's a danceable track, right? And um, you would actually take care of your set yourself as a professional DJ, not one of these spendles with two speakers and two basements and a couple of lights and let's go. That's not a DJ to me. Yeah. A DJ is a man that's got experience, that's done his knowledge. Uh, you know, he's got his knowledge of background of the music, where he's coming from, who's inside the music, what is the singer saying, what is the song, what is the beat, everything. A DJ that could match RPMs of a track is a good DJ. That mm -hmm. doesn't have to do too much work. Now, you've got all these DJs fiddling on, you know, with their mixers. I sit back and I've asked Punjab MC, why are they doing all this? He goes, it's just a part of, you know, having so many things in front of you and you're interested in turning things. But while they're doing it, they're bopping. But really, they're not making any difference mm. to what they're playing. It's, it's, just, a, it's just it's a habit. It's a habit. It becomes a habit. And we've got to get used to certain things that a lot of people don't understand what habits are. Mm. I've got probably I've got probably got bad habits because when I'm sitting down, I'm fidgeting and I'm fiddling. You with me? Even when I'm not happy with something on the screen, I have to go back to it 20 times before I'm happy with it. Mm. So, you know, it's good to have certain good habits, but it's also bad if you've got this thing going off and you're not doing no justice to a track. And basically, the DJ's playing the same thing over and over when the tracks are being released globally. I would use the word globally right now because the UK industry hasn't moved anywhere in the last 10 years. But it's up to the DJ to decide, right, I've got a UK album out. What do I want from this album? If he's a professional, he shouldn't just listen to it because I sent him a couple of tracks. He should listen to it regardless. Mm. This is where the is English that, is that because market is successful. You have to be a, a connoisseur of the music. You have to yeah, know it's about like, it. Look, 
I'm going to talk about the Bibsiopoli. Why are they not looking over their shoulder? Why are they not looking at the music? Why are they just pushing Bollywood, Bollywood? BBC stands for British Corporation, yeah? Yeah? British, uh, uh, bro uh, you know, bro uh, Corporation. Why are they not pushing uh, UK talent? Why is it always, you know, you got um, other other people in there that ain't really done much in the last five years to the industry, but their tracks ain't playlists? Bro, I, I'm going to be frank with you. None of them things bother me no more because I've got this thing in my head where all the best people I've worked with, the top range, I'm talking the legends of legends I've sat with, they said, brother, we didn't even have radio. We didn't even have a video. That's a good but point. we're out there and I'm taking that on board now that I don't need none of these people because I'm going to sit on my desktop. You know, I've got to actually scrutinise my album to give them the best. That's not how it should be, because that means I'm actually making choices out of my album, of my production, which I think is good and bad. That's not how it should be. That's wrong. For any producer to do that is wrong. But the way the Indian um, presenters are, you've got to spoon feed them. You've got to put it in their face. You know, you've got to actually put it in their face. Uh, you know, you've got to put it in the face. Why should it be like that? Mm. Why should it be like that with the DJ? It's this here. It's mm. this. This has gone deaf. Mm. They've gone deaf and done with it. All the presenters. I blame everybody. It shouldn't be a record label or a producer releases an album and we sit there emailing you and you don't even respond back. That's do you, wrong. Do you think then, just on the other side, I just wanted to think about this just in, in a second, in terms of like how, like, for example, there's a particular style of music that you produce, right? And then people, people have got their own audience. It's like Mukhtar Sahota, you mentioned earlier, he's got his own different sound. You know, with, as, as times are moving on, for example, that the, let, let's say a radio station, if they're not accommodating to the audiences that they're ringing up and say, I want this particular song, can you see the argument why they might do that and not actually kind of focus on the other bit? No, because it's still, it's down to individuals. It's down to law. If I'll tell you straight, yeah, you know, the BBC Asian Network, yeah, they don't know what they're doing. None of them. All the people that are coming there, I'll be frank with you. I'm quite open about this because mm. if they knew what they were doing, how many albums have you heard in the last five years that have been solid? I'm not even talking about mine. I said the last five years. I don't come in that five years. I mean, to be honest, there, there, were, there was the more drive on the singles rather than the albums, but it wasn't there. But I think we've seen this but year, But there's been five albums yeah. that have been dropped right? UK-based producers. Yeah. I'm not even going to say UK-based singers because yeah. that doesn't even come into the equation yeah. no more. Right? UK because producers. they're playing they're playing everything from abroad right now, yeah? So let's just talk about the UK-based albums. Yeah. How many albums in the last five years have been quite good? Let's say use the word quite good. I think True School dominates. <laughs> we are yeah. so you, that's very good then, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, 100%. Okay. Then we got then we had Verinda and Sean who are my yep. brethren as well. Many respects to them. They've just dropped another album. Today. <laughs> but that album, what I'm saying is that album won't get the airplay where it should be getting the airplay. Right. And this is where the problem is. It's individuals. And it's not up to the producer of the label to be sending that. Yeah, okay, there was a time when you needed um, you know, you needed the actual promoter, you needed um a plugger to go out there because that's how the mainstream work. But we don't have them kind of funds in our industry. Right. A label that's starting up hustling their way. We we can't afford to have pluggers that are charging us 11, 1200 pounds to plug our music to the mainstream channels. Yeah. But then I've got the other argument to that is how many how many Dajit's tracks or XYZ tracks did they get pluggers for? Never. They don't even want to know the Bibsy. It's closing. It's the Bibsy closing and scraping on what they think is right for their station. Mm. That's not how it should be. Because if you don't play good music, yeah, to the public, they ain't going to recognise the artist. They ain't going to know the album, the album. That means a flop in sales. That means a lot of pushing personally, pushing it to your friends, Facebooking it, spamming. People have seen me spam. I admit mm. it. I yeah. spam for a reason. Because I'm not a mainstream artist. I've never said... I'm a top artist. I never said that. What is a top artist now? Well, if, it, if it's right based now, on... Right top artist? I think if it's based on the figures and views, that you can't even trust them, obviously, because people are buying yeah, them. You so you've got it's that. It's all fake. It's all that, but it's that, it's that fight, isn't it? And that's what I was trying to say. It's just like, the it's really weird. The so fake. You only need a dark pair of shades, jump around with a few half-naked girls in front of a Jeep, and you got a track. 
right? That's what they think the industry is. These radio presenters are now not presenters. They're the artists themselves. So they're going on like they're the artists. Right. I, so I'm just, I'm just thinking, you know, from what you've been saying, that there's, you know, there's, there's obviously kind of you've sort of thought this out very heavily. There's a perfectionist within there of getting the sound, getting every you know the work yeah. ethic in there. If we could do that in a studio and we put our energy and life into it, then why is it rejected by somebody that's just heard something for thirty seconds and said, "No, we're not going to put that on your playlist"? And that's commonly with the BBC Asia Network. So I can it, tell you a thousand songs right now that you don't even know about that I've heard that are stayed underground. Right, that I've heard all over YouTube, I've heard from India, right the way across all over UK, I've heard that should have been in the A playlist, and so they're is, not in the A playlist. So is it now then, like, obviously you you, you will see the, the, the rise of people's social media brands are becoming more and more important because they've, you know, arguably they're, they're getting more views and ratings from, from their own platforms and they would have kind of, the, the, especially the lower, the, the smaller radio stations. Yeah, and, and, and again, I'll tell you what even shows it even more now than ever. A lot of the artists that were so-called big artists, they've ended up doing, I'm not going to name anyone, but they've ended up doing their own labels. When they've got their own labels, because they haven't got the money that was pushed in them, they are struggling to get the views. They are struggling to get the music out there now. And the question I ask everyone is why? I've got the answer to it, and I think you know the answer mm. to it, is because when the big labels were pumping the money, they had it openly, oh, we could do this, we could buy this, we could buy that, and it was happening. Now these same artists can't even get a 1,000 people in to watch them on a, on a rainy day. Mm. Forget a summer's day. They can't even get them on a rainy day. And this is, again, the showing of... Uh, uh, Brit Asia is one of the uh, biggest uh, TV's uh, channels for Bangra music right now from my recognition mm. of what I believe in. What have they achieved in the last 10 years? They've changed management, it's the same policies, nothing new has gone on there. It doesn't matter if a video is a lyrical video, it doesn't matter if there's not much happening in the video, you want new content, so play the bloody new content. Mm. How much more does an artist have to drive into the industry? Play it. I got, I mean, no offense to no one I'm hearing 80s Bangra every time on BBC Asia Network. Why? Is that what we're all about? I don't think so. so People the, are learning in, in from Ustad the Lork here. People are learning music from the highest end of percussionists of so forth. Even True School's got a band of uh, classes. PMC's started up his own whole Bronx, yeah? His own label, whole Bronx. Even though he's got PMC records, he started up a hub, which is called whole Bronx, yeah? There's a massive group of people in there. I'm not one of them because I choose to stay out of the circle because that's a learning thing. I've been there, done it. I don't want that circle. Yeah. I want to be somewhere else now because so, my aim is to go somewhere else because that's my, you know, I, I want to create something different. Every time I drop an album, I don't want that same old, you know, Ronnie Loop. I don't want that same old hip hop thing going on. If I'm going to rob a sample, I'm going to rob it blatantly so you know and everybody else knows I robbed it. So you know this aspiration in terms of like your own creativity. Then you went, you were. I'm just I'm trying to get this chronological so I could get it to the point of where we are today. Is in you. You were part of the. You were part of the band, and then when did you decide to do one of your first solo projects? And what and what was that? Um, I actually started a band called Bangra Limited in in Coventry, and it was for fun, and um, it got serious because um, everybody knows Radio Panja, their owner, Shinda Srila. His name was given by Baldev Mastana. I started a band called um, Bangra Limited, LTD, yeah? And we started gigging all over. We'd even done my cousin's wedding. We'd done loads of weddings. We done. We were actually on the wedding circuit. Within one year of rehearsal, we were already gigging. We were getting all the millers, everything. And I could even prove it with videos and everything. I got so much data, it's unbelievable. Right, we were gigging, and what happened is while we were gigging, people started interfering. Now, when you get that interference, you're either going to tolerate it and come better, you know, people with it, or there's going to be certain months following that political side of being in a band. Once you've got that political side of being in a band, it's game over. That's it. There's no more band. 
So I've done all of them things where I've tried to bring in new talent. I've worked with many new singers that are not known, you know, and I don't believe that there is any such thing as a big artist anymore. Everybody is approachable. Mm. But it's down to you how you want to work with that person if you're a producer. And then, so, did you, were you still in a band and you started to do your own production work? And did that yeah, take that's you what I mean, I started doing my own production work with this band. And this is what I'm saying. When the politics came in, I had to walk away. I actually started recording a song, which was sang by, um, uh, it was sang by Omar al in the 80s on a stage of Chumkilla. And we'd done the song, it was called Lokoi Jatabajau. And me and the Gora guitarist, we started the work, yeah. And we actually done like a slight antra. We didn't even get to the first, second verse because the guy just got a massive ego after that. He was like, oh, we're getting the gigs. People are knowing me. But when you left him on his own to sing for half an hour, his throat was gone. He was all over the shop. So that's where, you know, uh, it, it was a bit of a downfall and a bit of a discouragement for myself to see that happen. Because politi- when people start getting political in any kind of industry, it always goes tits up. That's it. So the, and and that was kind of you know, I'm just trying to kind of relate it to some of the stuff that I know about you as well. But that was because you, you were having such high standards when you when you were in the same band as when Gulit Malik was coming into the into the UK as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I you know before even Perwanda, I actually played with a guy called Morn Mustanna, and it was in 1981, 82 he came to the UK, and my dad used to work in a factory where he used to walk past this butcher shop. The butcher that owns the shop knew my dad because my dad would pick up a chicken from there or whatever on the way back home from work. And while they were chatting, he goes, oh, we're looking for a percussionist. I was only about six and a half years of age, if I can remember. And my dad goes, yeah, no problem. Have a go with my son. The other one's in the band. You could, you know, ask him if he's interested. So at six and a half years of age, you don't have a yes or no. If your dad <laughs> says you're going to do it, you do it. Yeah. So it was one of them. So I joined Mon Mustana. While I was gigging with Mon Mastana, one of Kaldeep Manik's um, keyboard players, Raju his name was, I remember him, because he's a lovely guy. He looked after me, Bear. And you know when someone looks after you, you never forget him in life. And uh, I remember him coming up to me and going, Kaka, there are number here. And in those days, we didn't have my balls. We just gave him my house number. So I gave him my house number as much as I can remember it. And my writing's all over the place like a kid. And I go, oh, you have to speak to my dad. Then I gave him my dad's name. And then he goes, okay. He goes, to I go, uh, you know, my Punjabi wasn't very good then. And I said, Gwentri, <laughs> with a little voice. And he goes, okay, okay. And that was all I heard from the guy. Next minute, I'll be dragged over with the butcher and my dad to their house. And Kaldeep Manik sitting there. I didn't even know who Kaldeep Manik was. At the age of uh-huh. six, I didn't even know who he was. He just looked like a guy who just got this sharp, horrible, squeaky voice. This is how I seen him. And basically, I couldn't handle it. And he was moaning all the time when I met him. You know, he shook hands with me and he goes, told and I didn't understand him. I looked at my dad, he goes, um, he <laughs> my dad signal like that. <laughs> yeah. And I said, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hanji Uncle G. Yeah. And he goes, yeah. And my dad, then I had to get my dad to interpret that to me. And anyway, as it went on, I started to learn about Kuldeep Monik during the period of the time he was in the UK. I did my first gig in a, in a, in a pub called the Bricklayers Arms. They were all factory workers, all people from industries, uh, you know, or engineering factories, bakeries. It was on a Christmas Eve. I got dragged there and they said, Well, the Monic's coming. You better be there. So my dad took me to this pub. I mean, so how, old are, you, how old are you going into this pub if we, for that session? About seven and a half to eight years of age. Very small guy I was. Even now, I'm not tall. I'm not tall. I'm only five foot seven. You know, so I wasn't, I wasn't a big guy. I've never been a big guy. I was tiny. I was about. I don't know, man. Yeah, you're small. Yeah, you're small. So you, so you get just, dragged... just above a golf golf club. <laughs> so, you, <laughs> so, so you go, so you go into this pub, rowdy old guy sitting there. Yeah, they were playing cards and some were playing these dominoes. You know, you got the Jamaican guy slamming these dominoes and I'm hearing all these noises. And my dad goes, "Come here, come here." He, he, he's got me standing at the bar. The bar's up there. 
and I don't even know what they're doing behind the bar, yeah? He gives me a roaring squash, my dad. And he goes, well, take me that, and he gives me a packet of crisps on crisps. And then they were so beautiful to eat. I enjoyed the crisps more than the drink. And I sat there with my little hand going in there. And next minute, Marnik walks in with a shiny shirt, don't laugh, but I got looking at him thinking, who the hell's this? Yeah? You know, is this the same guy I met at the house? And my dad goes, yeah, he's the same guy. He goes, uh, he goes, he goes, uh, yeah? And he goes, uh, so bro, I'm sitting on the floor, chonkri marke, yeah, cross, you know, yeah. sitting down, like well, legs crossed, and I've got the bongos in between my legs on the on the floor. No mics. He didn't have no mic. I never had no mics. Nothing. I didn't even know what a mic was. Where they put this ply board, a big thick ply board or chipboard over the snooker table. Yeah, pool table, and he's climbed up there, you know, like a little rat climbed up. I'm sitting there, no word of a lie, this is funny. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at this guy and he starts going, okay, one, two, one, two, three. Bro, I didn't know what I was playing to. I just played a Sydney Charlie, dunk, 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 you know, four, four, tall beat, yeah. Pure Sydney Charlie, yeah, no worries, yeah. And uh, no, I didn't no, even know he, what I was there was no Vanta, it was just you and him. Was. Just you and him, that's it, just two that's of you. It. He started on Jitiro, ding, 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 and that tumbi rang in my ears and it made me fall in love with the instrument, you know. And then I kept on looking at him. My, don't forget, I'm sitting on the same board as him and he's standing there banging his feet. So I, every time he's banging his feet, I'm getting a, a bit of a shutdown on this thing. And bro, you know what the funny thing was? The guy was just a maniac. That's how I seen him back then, a maniac. A crazy guy on the loose for music. That's how I seen him, and I wasn't. I was an into none of that. You see, you know. I, you know, I'm learning drums the calm way from a guy one to one, two shun, paradiddles, learning all my fills. You know, off beats. You know, one drops and stuff. And then you got Kaldi Mani going one, two, three, four, tack, tack, tack. and I'm thinking to myself, what do I do now? People are dancing again. Crazy money's being thrown. You know. I can't even remember how much I got paid. I got paid, but I don't remember how much. I think my dad's kept me on that. I think my dad's kept me on that. Some more crisps. Take them on. Bro, I must have had about three packs of crisps that day, and that's a lot of crisps. You get me back in the days. And don't forget, there was none of this scrimping on crisps, especially in the pubs. There was They had the big sort of family bags, you know, and yeah. I sat there putting man in and got these crisps spilling out of the bag and he's slamming the floor on the you know, So do you remember, do you remember like uh, any feedback? So like, obviously you've done the gig and you've gone back. Did he say, what did he say to you? Yeah, yeah. He gave me his feedback. He goes, shall I, shall I, pat on the back, you know, slapping me on the back of the gitchy right here on the back of the head. Oh, shall I, stay like, I can't protect that, it? The boy, good boy, he has that good boy and he's touching my chin and he's pulling my cheeks like really hard. I left out there bruised, black and bruised, to be honest. You know, and I thought, this is great. I played a, I played a bit of percussion for the man and he beats me up after the gig. You know, that's how I've seen it. It's funny, but it's what, it, <laughs> it's what it was, bro. So, then, so, like, so obviously you, you've built up a relationship. So every time he was coming, he'll, he'll ask for you. He goes, I'm having him. Yeah, there was times when I couldn't go there and there was times when I could go. And there was a lot of the times it was like I would go. A lot of the times. And people don't believe me when I tell them. Early, a guy called Big Karakanga, who always looked after him, who actually done the introduction in the first place through Mon Mastana, he used to drink, and I didn't know what they used to do. I used to be in the back of the seat, and then Monica would sit at the back. He'd be sitting at the back. Sometimes he used to be drunk. That's how I seen him, a drunk singer, yeah? And people might not like what I'm saying, but this is the truth. And we got to get to the core of the truth. He used to love KFC, bro. He used to make us drive all the way from London with no food, yeah? And them journeys were long, bro. And he'd pull up in Birmingham at KFC on Soho Road. <laughs> what by you know how beautiful KFC was back then, bro. By the None thing. of you people, I tell you now, I think there's only a minority of people that will agree with me that KFC back in the 80s, 83, I think it started. I was born 82, so I don't know, man. Oh, when I had it with Monik, it was my first time. And you know when they call it finger licking? Bro, it was finger licking chicken. 
You don't understand. I used to take the paper and lick the paper. It was that beautiful. The masala, the, the black peppers. Nowadays, you don't see no black pepper. It's just butter. Horrible oh, butter. I, I just have burgers from the... I can't have it. So he... He, so he came, he was he he loved he loved the chicken. Yeah, the... Manuka, no, no, can I just sell caca 20, 20 pound in one pound notes and they look like a wad of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you imagine the notes, yeah. they weren't coins, notes. And he'd send me, and because uh, I speak English, he'd send me and the driver. And the driver, obviously, Bikar Kang, don't speak that much English. Yeah, uh, I do my friend, you know, give me a uh, loon body. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was them kind of things. And Monica would be sitting there ready. He wouldn't even drink anything, brother. He'd be waiting for that chicken. And he wouldn't even let us drive off. He'd be like, Nay, kaka, apa te And people that know me, they know I'm speaking the truth because people that know Monica, he loved KFC, bro. What was this? He wouldn't even eat roti. You know, when he came to UK, <laughs> yeah. he didn't want roti. He used to say, masale ari, uh, chicken khaniya. Chalo te khandeya. He used to make the promoter drive all the way to Birmingham from the black country to Birmingham. And then they used to go, before they used to come to country to pick me up, they'd go down Birmingham, pick up KFC for me as well, and themselves. And they'd be all like, the smell of KFC, the aroma of KFC in the car was unbelievable. My, my dad I grew up with KFC, bruv. My, my dad used to say, like, he remember seeing him at uh, the Newins pub in, um, in Hansworth. At the That's top, right, yeah. yeah, yeah, and he's see, he seen him from there. And, and he always told me a story where the fight kicked off, and he goes, to, Monica had to jump from a, from a wall, which is like 13 foot off. Uh, 30 That's right, foot yeah, high. he's done all of that, bro. He's done all of them, Bungie. Yeah, it's yeah. only because he didn't think someone's could request, and people started bullying him up and that because he was a small guy, he was only four foot something. You so know you, what I mean? What was he? Was there another like a gig that you remember with him that, that stands out? Yeah, all of them. All of them. I mean, uh, he swore at his budget at once, called him a, a bummer on the loose because he couldn't play the keyboard. He was drunk. And he goes, I don't know why I bring these bummers on the loose to the UK when they can't even play. He said it straight down the mic. Well, I was in Pura Wanda Sagi on stage and it was a wedding as well. And people were clapping the chair and whistling at him. And I thought, great. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? And then, if, if people could tolerate that of him in a wedding, and this is at the Holt School, Holt, the Holt, Holt yeah, school. yeah, yeah, is, is it's it still a, it's there? A, yeah, it's a grammar school now. It, it's a grammar okay. school. It's a, no, it was a, it was at Holt Grammar. Now it's an academy. Yeah, it's still at Aston. Well, in that picture, you, a lot of people are seeing me with. I'm wearing a blue silky yeah. a satin shirt with cream trousers, and there's a there's a curly guy, the guitarist, mm. and the band itself, and a gora in there, a Scottish lad, a bass player. That was our band as we were pushing ourselves up, getting into the late, I'd say, yeah, I'd say that's a progression of the late 80s now. We're hitting into the 90s. And at that time, we were at Monarch, and he was actually in the wedding. So how, old, we how found old, out, so how old are you when you, so you started? I must have been about 16 to 15, 15 16, maybe even 17 at that time. And, and he didn't he didn't recognize me because I'd have, I had about five, six years gap in between, not seeing him on it. Even though he was here, like I said, there'll be shows where I'm not, you know, not been able to do them because of commitment to other bands and stuff. So um when we what? met him at the gig and I was playing drums, I had a Simmons kit, and in the Simmons kit, I'd programmed like a doll, like a timbala sound. Mm. And he goes to me, he goes, Kaka, I sat there just going and that's all I kept doing in every track. So was there any other it. was there any other singers that you were working that that you were part of? Sorry? Was there any other singers that you got called in to play alongside from when they were coming on from India? Um yeah, there was a guy called uh what was his name? Uh you had more Mustana. There was quite a few, there was quite a few. Um some of them don't stick out that much in my head. There was like the Gyanis as well. I played in Gurdwaras and yeah. stuff. Um, there was a guy, Jaginder, he was a singer. Uh, then there was this young couple, just a Vinder or something, just Beer, just Beer or something. I played with them. Yeah. Then they were coming with a group of comedians and uh, Galabo Masi, she was there. Um, they'd done some major shows. I just, I wasn't with them, but I was just a part of the group, if that makes sense. Do you, ever, do you ever feel like writing this stuff down in a book? Because like from all the stories that you're saying now, 
this if it doesn't well, they kind of go with you grave, it'd be nice to have it in writing and launching a book about the originality of how things were back then I think there'd be I'd like pictures of mine like Winnie the Pooh's got pictures I'd like pictures with mine but I'd you, like someone to but, sketch that memory you know not just you, write about it but, but you, like I'm just going to uh, touch on it now in terms of like when you're on social media you know the way that you in essence, are doing a form of this really, which is podcasting and kind of the storytelling, you know, to going yeah. onto it. I think just turning the comments off would help quite a lot. But you know, if you were just going onto the, the stories and stuff, I think this is the goal that people would would love to hear. Well, you know, when I was on the internet, like I said, we all make mistakes. You know, I had my I had my runnings, you know, and uh, not going into too deep, but you know, I had a lot going on in my personal life as well. Mm. Uh, I'm in a lot better place now with God's grace. I, I only had about six, hand, like, not even a handful. I can't even say a handful. There were really six people that guided me out of a dark place. I'm not going to say their names because obviously they're mind if I say it. Mm. But they, them people are truly believing and I truly speak to them to this day. And they're the only ones that allowed my new pad, if you get what I mean. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, anyone else is just, you know, not even musically. I don't need them here. You know, like I said, we've got a hub now where we could go and record. So, you know, I didn't get personal with anyone. You know, them days are gone for me. That was four or five years ago. I'm not on no socials. I'm not interested in socials because when I grew up, we didn't have socials anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, socials is to make or break. And I think I made a little bit and I broke a little bit as well. You know, mm -hmm. so it's a balance of the two. But mm -hmm. you know, if they get hold of something, they think is the best thing in in anything until they can abuse it. And when that person don't allow you to abuse it, then you're the enemy. So it's what it is, you know? Yeah, um, I, I definitely would say that though, Raj, because, you know, it was funny, you know, because when I was putting this podcast together, I think it, 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 when I was out there, I, I made a list of it and I wrote, I wrote, I wrote DC, DDC, I wrote DDC and I went, oh, <laughs> that's going to, that's going to be a, that'll be a big one. And um, I've, I've, I've told a couple of people I'm like getting you on and stuff, and they're like, oh, definitely. Because I think one of the things that nobody, can, regardless whether somebody agrees with you or not, you're definitely going to hear a version of the truth. Of course. And, and I think sometimes when you're on social media, people can manipulate that truth or take a little snippet and do that. And, I, and you know, people do take it to, the, to play it to their advantages and, you know, you know and, and, you know, to put people, very rarely do we help people come up we're kind of experts of bringing it down. I've been guilty. Everyone's been guilty of it as well. And I, I could just then, you know, it was one of the things where we had this chat before was, you know, I could definitely feel that you, you, you've you moved on. There was definitely kind of a journey has been experienced and, and you've moved on to an, to another. another I think batch. that was made for me. That I think as a person, just a hustler coming up the street <laughs> and getting on the social media, it was an excitement time, you know? And I think that was a journey where it was, I had to do it for myself. Um, I don't mean that that I had to do it. you got to be in my frame of mind to think yeah. how I'm trying to say. It. So I don't want to sound wrong when I say I had to do it. It was like, everyone's on about it. Let's get on it. Let's see what it is. That kind of had to do it for me. And I thought if I can make a comedy show out of it, have a banter, then great. But I didn't realise that certain parts of my banter is not acceptable in society. Yeah. I could tell dirty jokes all day long. I could be swearing all day long. I choose not to. You know, I don't do that now. I don't, I, you know, people that know me, really know me, they'll tell you that this guy is not about that. And, and it's true, I'm not. And I've just found myself, after going through all that dark darkness, I've found myself. And I'm lucky I found myself without committing suicide. I found myself without the, the drug elements. I found myself without all the nasty stuff that we, yeah, depression is always with you. We are all born with all these viruses, depressions, anxieties. We're all born with them. If I said to you, would you jump on a moving train? You would have said, no way, you think I'm stupid. That's not you actually being scared. That's your anxiety talking. And people have got to understand that there's a lot of things that people go through in life that causes anxiety and depression. I actually did a song called uh, Real Zindagi based on what I've been through. And people are asking me, you said it's based on a true story. What is the true story? I said, go and ask my best mate around the corner. He'll tell you. I shouldn't have to tell you the story. If you think you know me, then you should understand the story. Mm -hmm. And that's where the forgiveness comes in. 
and I find that our society is not a forgiving society. As a bande di baan jado na farde ya, as yodi baan jappini po onno farde, as yodi utha le nu setha de bande from the bar, we pull them down. Instead of them taking them up, we got to pull them down. Yes, there are occasions where I admit where I've had deals go tits up with me and I've just said it straight to the guy. There's your road, there's mine, do one. That's it. I don't believe in going to big labels that are asking you for money. All these so-called T series, F series, you know, ABC, whatever you want to call these people, yeah? They mean absolutely nothing to me because they can't pay for the art I have. They can't pay for my life experience. They can't pay for the jutti I've been given by Ustad Law. They can't pay for all the gun I've got of Kuldeep money. They could never take that out of me. Doesn't matter how many times you try and beat me up, you cannot take that away from me. And real friends will believe in you. The fake friends will believe in the rumors. If you got something to say to me, then you should pick up the phone or email me or address it to me directly, which will be more respected from me to you that you've actually contacted me directly. You know, I see people still using my swearing video, you know, and to me, it's a joke. It's a banter. They've actually snipped that apart and exploited it. But the thing is, if you go on TikTok, you got auntie dancing half naked, swearing at their husbands. You got uncle swearing half naked and he's a pilot. He's an excellent pilot, but he chooses to sit there and swear at the world. Why are people not using them? Because it's about if you're in the public limelight, which I don't even think I am, but these clowns think I am, right? They're trying to exploit me to a point where it, it, it'll destroy my career. And I'll be honest with you, you can't destroy a man's career who actually started his career from nothing. You can't destroy that because mm -hmm. I can rebuild it again and I'll mm -hmm. continue. Right now, I'm sitting in my studio making beats for a lot of people. Then people ain't going to write my name down because I've got a trans, uh, a, a, a sort of like a, 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 an agreement with them where I'm charging them for my mm -hmm. talent which I shouldn't because they still can't pay me for my talent because the value of someone's talent, you can never pay for, especially at my age and with all the experiences I've had, you know, I've been beaten up by my dad, I've been beaten up by my brother, my mom, everyone, who cares? Who cares? If there was no social media, where would you go and do your dirty laundry? It's a good point. It's a it's a really good point, and the, you know if if you reflect back on it and you look at everyone else's a, 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 an individual's own journey just on social media, there's a lot of things that people regret that they've written on there, and, and you know, and it, and it's costed. With the awesome. uh, with you know, we just said your development, you did album like captured and you know reggae wisdom and all these kind of you know this you've always produced and you've always put out content and you've put out content for yourself. You came to it was interesting because you, you're doing the album Alcohol, right? And I know when, when we had the discussion, this became a really deep conversation that, that we had a, around it. Can you just t tell me a little bit about the experience in terms of when you were working on your, the current latest album that you're, gonna, that you're doing now? Because I don't really want to say current and latest one because there's still a journey to be had with it. Yeah. Okay, basically, the Alcohol album, how it started, I've done a Thwali track, yeah? And it was on the album Capture. It was Farke De Kubo De Lute Kida Maike. That song was done by Nikki Kato, two brothers they were, and they were both drinkers, heavy drinkers from Punjab, yeah? And basically, they both died at separate times, obviously, and they had a singing career which only lasted for about 18 months, if that. And they'd done the song, and the only writer that I knew was the guy who I was in the band with, was, was uh, Jinder Pandal, yeah, from Desi Boys in Coventry. He, he is one of our lead singers in Purwanda Sangeet, right? Those that don't know. So I approached him and I said, look, you sang this on my nephew's first birthday at my dad's house in a Mayfield. Have you got that? He goes, oh, the bo prani ga le, the video la bula. Now I've got the video, but the video didn't play right. You get me? Yeah. And uh, it's done on a camcorder, transferred into VHS. So he's all got these squiggly lines and where you want to hear the wording, you can't hear it. So I got most of the wording, but I didn't get all of it. So when I approached him, he sat there and he goes, you know, you brought up all memories. And uh, with him being a legend himself, you know, he knows a lot, that guy. 
Dumby player. That yeah. Dumby, he carries his. He gave me a Dumby. Dumby. Yeah, he gave me yeah. a Dumby when I was young. Came to the house. Um, Bro, he, that that Dumby is a homemade Dumby. You know that. Smashed the it. black one. <laughs> Guess who made that? The other singer in the band, Dave Singh. Yep. He used to run Punjabi Jessica. He made that Dumby with all his talent. He, you know, carved it out. He got this cookie, you know, coconut. He carved the coconut with knives and stuff. And then he drilled it. Then he shaved it. Then he grinded it. And the guy did not stop until he made this Dumby for Arjinda. But they said before they were a band, they were just jamming. Mm. They were jammers. You know, Mayfa Lalini got it on a Friday night. Let's have a rehearsal. They, they, don't, they don't understand. That wasn't a rehearsal. That was a jam. Yeah. Mm. So basically, they used to jam with the harmonium uh, and so forth. And my brother would turn up. They'd all have a little jam, just four of them. And that's where it all grew from. And now, going back to the situation of... Um, the album. The, sorry? The, the album. You were getting to... Yeah, the album. Song. What happened is, I decided to do that song again on Captured. Yeah? And I did it with Sukhwinder Panchi, who's a legend singer himself. And I did it in a way where it was going to be folk with a twist of new wording. So we changed some of the wording. But lately, in the, over the last five years, I've redone it with the original lyrics. Because that's how long it's taken me from Captured. Right the way up to now, it's taken me 11 years to get the original lyrics. And this is where a lot of people don't appreciate music of what we have to do. The research that goes behind it. Now, going on to the alcohol album, that song was actually going to be on here. But what happened with Amar Singh Litra, who passed away three days after Diwali, three, four days after Diwali, bless his soul. He's one of my closest brethren, and I was working very closely, and he sang a Sharab song for me. And when he sang that Sharab song, it hit me. You know, when something just grabs you, it hit me badly. It just shook me. And then I turned around and said to my guy, you know what? Let's do this song. Let's do it. He hummed and hard to me. He goes, oh, how, will the, how is the world going to, you know, take this on? You know, look at that gig. I like a little up and there. We're a minor thing. And I said, trust me, the, the world's going to love it. Trust me. I kept on saying to him, trust me. Um, while I'm looking at my screen, as I was going to actually play you a snippet of the song, yeah? <laughs> You're fiddling. You said you always fiddle when you are in your studio. Yeah, and it always happens to me, you know. And um, the song, I've just called it Sharab. Or should I be? Yeah, it's one or the other. Because it's just all in at the moment. It's still in the phase of um, mastering and stuff and final titling. So one song started, and then it became from one song to another. He goes, "I've got this one as well. I've got that one." And then I gave him a few sharp tracks, which were lying around in my studio. And then I said, "Let's change the lyrics. Let's get these uh, lyrics going a bit different." Yeah, and he goes, "Okay." So. Basically, it started from there, and then we just ended up with um, we just ended up with the Shrab album with eight tracks. And I said, "No, no, no, this ain't enough for a Shrabi. He wants more Shrab because mm. I'm a drinker. If I want to drink, I drink heavily. I could drink a litre bottle and still be a bit sober. But if I go outside and smell the fresh air, I breathe it in. I'm drunk. <laughs> you get me? And it, it, to me, it was like." Every part of everything I've done has a part of me in there. And it had a part of him in there as well. And also the music had a part of me in there because not just me producing it, I was drinking when I'd done some of the songs. And I can't produce them again like that because they're like my one hit sounds. You know, I've just turned around, pressed a button. Oh, I love that bang, just because of the sound, right? So what's happened with this Sharab album, and don't forget, many Bangra artists have done Sharab songs. Many. And um, what I found with this album was, it's like, even now I'm thinking, it's, it's become sentimental and emotional journey for me. And when that happens to me in an album, I want to delay every process of making a track because I want to take the fresh air come back in with fresh ears and I want to have a listen to it again and again. The reason being, if it doesn't give me goosebumps like this singer did and has, I don't want to do the track. Mm. That just doesn't go for lyrics. It doesn't go for just the music. It means the whole content of that one track. If one part of it is making me itch, 
and I could correct it, then I will. Nobody is perfect. Nobody. So before we even start criticizing, oh, he's trying to be a perfectionist, I'm not. I've probably made thousands of mistakes that the people are going to pull up. And I'm happy if they do, because that'll improve my work. That's what mm. we're about. And I don't lose anything by sitting in my studio and doing something because I'm not paid not to correct something. I'm not paid by the public. I'm paid by my own graph from behind. Yeah, that's my payment. That's my that's my currency. Uh, savings. That's your own currency. Yeah. yeah, that's all. Yeah, that's all my savings that I'm putting into this track. So basically, um, if it's okay with you, I want to play. You yeah, man, go track. for it. And basically, you'll hear the kind of twisted elements I've actually put into this track, and it's it's quite twisted up because it's got that reggae deep feeling, and it's got that. Um, do you remember Ghost Town? This town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like girls town. It was about the 80s, how all the pubs when Margaret Thatcher, the rioting, the strikes was going on, things were getting worse than a ghost town. We've just now experienced that in the 20s century by being on a lockdown. That's what, to me, that's what ghost town was. The streets are empty, the clubs are closing down, the bars are empty, oh, the restaurants are empty. Now, I took them kind of elements and this is, again, this album has been done during the pandemic. Well, yeah, during the pandemic. And it started off in 2019, the album did. And I put it on hold because I wasn't feeling certain things. There were certain elements, not just of the music. It was like the vocal. I, went, I wanted to step it up, change it. Yeah. I wanted more feeling. He couldn't sing the way I wanted him to sing on some of the beats. So it, I made his life difficult, to be honest. You get me? Because that's what... I think a producer should do is make a singer's life difficult. Everyone could sing on a the Irani beat or whatever, you know, sing on a loop. Anyone could do that. But if you want to put some coordination and you want some tried chords, you want diminished notes, you want to talk about all of these elements of pianos. I'm not a great piano player. I'm not a great keyboard. But, you know, I learn from my own stuff. I'm, I'm self-taught. Mm. I admit that I learn. I've made loads of mistakes when I've had to go back to my one of my other boys on the keyboard and say, bro, I've got this chord, does this work? I've had to ask questions. I've, I get battered by PMC. When I ask him and I show him something, he's like, no, that's wrong. It should be like that. Then I'll go back and take that on board and I won't copy it, but I'll remember yeah. that that bit is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just going to play this little vibe, yeah? Have a listen. Go for it. <laughs> Basically, that's a clip of the track. Now, the intro itself talks in volumes. They said, My friends are sitting there. Oh, la la glassy, la la glassy. I'll start drinking. 
when I started drinking, they started calling me the bad guy. Just because they wanted to play with the man. Like Chun Li, uh, Nicki Minaj said, they call me the bad guy because all they want to do is play their keyboards and call me the bad guy. Yeah, so that's what the shade is saying. That Palame, when I became a drinker, they all started calling me the bad guy. And I, I, and just from the vocal delivery, you could hear what a, what a lost talent that we that that has just been experienced within the industry as well. I mean, he's related to Lember as well, Lember and Sainsbury. And uh, the guy, he never sang in minor scales. I had to make him sing certain tracks in minor scales, but even then he was going up two more keys. This is like, this is basic singing for this guy. And every time I heard his voice, there was this thing in his throat. And I said to him, until I don't hear that in my songs, I won't get goosebumps. And I made him do that in a lot of the tracks. There's this thing in his throat, what he does. And um, it's like a vibrato right from here. He don't do it from the stomach upwards. He does it from here. And there ain't many singers that could deliver that. And it's like, I've actually sliced this guy. That's his, say, that's his head, that's his neck, that's his throat, that's his chest, that's his lungs. I've actually sort of like had to go a little colour map of what part I'm feeling to explain myself to the guy. You know, I had to put like a red mark on this part to say, mm -hmm. and, and the guy, phenomenally, yeah. Oh my God, I can't even tell you. Phenomenally, he came through with the stuff. He grounded it. You know, I listen to all, you could tell from, I don't know if you can see my CDs. Yeah, I listen I to all, all types of music. That's just half of them. i got a room full of them. You get me? I listen to hip hop, reggae, jungle, you name it. I listen to everything, yeah. And like, I've really got certain idols I look up to, like Bob Marley, Madonna. Because when Madonna dropped her erotica album, if people listen to it carefully, there's 110,000 samples in there that you can use. This is how you've got to have the ear and the way the beats are being made. They're all from live uh, hardware plugins, live drumming, you know, electronic plugins and stuff like that. And the thing is, nowadays, you could buy a whole keyboard that does everything for you. But is that going to satisfy you if you got the itch to have a lot more in your tracks? Like some of these sounds you're hearing, they're not done just by a piece or whatever. There's a lot of collaboration of sounds in there. You know, I decided in, in front of the shed, instead of having a shed just singing with a duffley or something, I'm going to put the drums in straight, pure hip hop, 4-4 four, four beat going straight in there, bang. So, so Raj, then, in, in terms of when, you know, what does the next sort of six to 12 months look like for you in terms of in terms of this? Dirty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be dirty in the game. Definitely. I'm going to be dropping bombs all over the place. I want to cause a world war in Bangor. That's it. That's how I'm seeing it. And I don't care if people buy my music. I don't care if they don't listen to it. But I ain't going to stop. I'm going to be in the way of everyone. That's it. In the way of PMC, everyone, even though he's my little star, yeah, my brother, I'm going to be in the way of everyone. Even if they don't listen to my music, they're going to have to go back and listen to it. That's how bad I'm going to make it this year. They're going to have to stop and listen. You can't just go past my window. In my shop, you got to stop and look at the shop. Get that KFC. <laughs> I'm telling you, bro. You're gonna. Uh, you know what it is. That's that's not me being hating on anyone or saying I'm better than people. What that saying inside me is that the fire I've got little and the way I'm burning it is I want everyone to see the fire and appreciate it. I want them to be a part of that journey. I don't. I don't. I don't want to be reaching out to fake radio presenters. I say, but you may not please lado. I don't want them arguments no more. I've done that hustle where I've had to call individuals and say, bro, you never played my track, what's going on? I know many people that do it, but they won't admit it. I know loads of producers that have done it. Even the radio presenters won't tell you who they are because they think, oh, if they say that, they've made a, a wave. I don't care, I've done it. I've done it to loads of people. I've done it to loads of radio presenters where I've chased them up. to say I don't have a see, then they blag it. How about you, I <laughs> on your Google uh, uh, speaker, where did you put it on? Because I never heard it. Because I would expect at least one email from one person to say, buddy, your album was sick. I heard this track. What album's that from? 
If I'm not getting that one feedback, I'll be honest with you, Ricky, I don't care who listens to my album, if I'm really frank with you. What bothers me is feedback. I only need one genuine person to give me a feedback. I said, I thought they didn't come crazy, whatever. I will take that on board as a gift, not as a hatred. Yep. Even if it's a producer, another producer telling me, I'm open for ideas. I'm not one of them guys. You know, I speak to loads of singers. I speak to loads of people all day. You know, I, I believe in Charanji Tudja, you start Charanji Tudja. He loves me. I've done some mixes and masters for him. And he loves me. The guy loves me. I've never met him. He loves me. We just got this overseas bond where we like one another and we talk straight open. He don't give me no crap. I don't give him no crap. And he gets on. We just get on with it. That's it. You know, a lot of people won't believe me, but I speak to him nearly every other week. Even when he was poorly, I was on the phone to him. Because I find that loving somebody is not just about loving them. It's about loving what they did. If they could, if people could change me musically, then I don't need the telling off from my mum or my dad, even at my age. I don't need that telling off. Well, bless my dad, he's no longer with us. Again, you know, that album here, that was, another, you know, the album itself, that was another part of, you know, what my dad's favourite tracks would have been if he heard it, what he would have liked. Because when I was doing the dummies on some of this track, my dad was alive in 2014, but he wasn't with the singer. They were just like dummies. and. Um, when I used to give him headphones, I said, Dad, Dad, listen to this. He'd sit back with all his anxiety, his depressions, his uh, stroke. He'd sit back and he'd be like, what a good dear, what a good dear. Encouragement. That's all I would expect from anybody in the industry is don't discourage anyone, encourage people. Encourage to be better. That's what my New Year's res resolution is, to be better. Yeah. Is to be better for the people as well. Mm. Thanks, Raj. I'm, um, you know, it's been. I, I, I wanted to kind of show the other side. It, you know that you know the relationship in terms of your knowledge and the love that you have for music is second to none. Um, and fantastic. And like I said, really, really wishing you all the best for for the project. I'm definitely. Uh, I'll, I'll listen to it and I'll I'll ring you and feed you back as well. So yeah, definitely. I really appreciate write it. Write it. It doesn't matter. To me, you know, like if someone puts something in writing and he's got a bit of negativity, yeah. I would take that as positivity right now. I'd be blessed to even hear it. Yeah. Because you haven't heard the product, you've just heard this. Yeah. I want to be able to surprise people. And that's what I say. I am going to cause a massive war where I want people to see what's going on in my war. Because that war's between me and music now. Yeah. I don't care about no radio presenters. Good music's never played on radio anyway. You know what I mean? <laughs> good music records if you look at the records the hardcore stuff is always hidden at the back it's not because they don't want to sell it it's because they want to make sure they sell it to the right person who will appreciate it so my music I'm telling the whole world is I don't care if you don't buy my music don't buy it I don't want you to buy it but there's going to be one thing that stops you is going to be when you hear something and it makes you have goosebumps and it gives you you know like a twist to your brain of what you've been hearing and then suddenly something fresh comes out and you've heard it, that is a big change in people. And that's what we got to change. We've got to change the way people think. We've got to change the way people feel. We've got to give them feeling music. We've got to give them everything in one package. As a producer, that's what my aim is. And I, I, I'm really not interested in being proud of being on the radio, A-list, playlist, whatever. I don't care. I, I don't care anymore. I've gone past that stage. I could start on my own radio station with the help of the social media. I could probably start on my own social media radio because you don't even need brains to do that. All yeah, you what? need is a pod, pod mic. No, I'm not saying you... <laughs> no, I'm you can do what, it. No, what, you're can doing, do it. <laughs> what you're doing is... Bro, but what you're doing is different. You're actually approaching people and getting the inside of what it is. I'm talking about just playing music. Yeah, yeah. You don't need brains to press play on a, on a CD deck. You could just carry on playing it. I could rinse my whole, I could rinse my whole library every day with stuff I haven't even released, yeah. and 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 it's going to make people stand and will listen. It's, it it will because there's always a fan base for everything. There's a fan base for gala. There's a fan base for cooking. There's a fan base for drinkers. There's a fan base for dabe. There's a fan base for everything. Shoes, trainers, laces, copra, lira. There's a fan base for everything. Nothing is excluded. 
everything is included. And if you could get the right people, which is easy, and sell them something, even if they don't buy it and they just listen to it, it's a big, big thing for me. Yeah. With everything that's gone on in life over the last few years, I don't even want to look at 2021 because it was not here or there. But if we look at 22 in a positive way for everybody and support everyone, that we'll make things better. Surely we can make things better. If they're now planting trees to make the environment better, then why can't we plant good music to make our industry better? Thank you, Raj. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you for all your help. Thank no you problem. for your support. I really appreciate the time you've given us. Bless up.